Elwell? I am Rodney Elwell. Do you wish to see me? Pickett. I beg your pardon. Sarah Pickett. Quite so, your name. In any case, I'm late they for They said for me to come right away. Who said? The agency. The agency? What agency? Well, of course, the detective agency, Sergeant Coonan. Yes, come in, come in. If I come in, does the door get closed? Naturally. Then I don't come in. Why not? You know why not. You're grown up. My dear Mrs. Pickett. Miss Pickett, I... and don't butter me up. I have conducted my affairs behind closed doors for 20 years. Not with me. You overestimate both of us. Have it your way. Yes, here we are. You are Rebecca Pickett, is that correct? Sarah Pickett. Quite so. Sarah. Rebecca Pickett is my grandma. Was your grandma? She still is. She's 103. Interesting. She's a liar. Possibly. 108 if she's a day. Probably. Miss Sarah Pickett, you were engaged some 15 years ago by one Noah Pretorius. As his housekeeper? That's right. Where? Goose Creek, where I come from. Goose Creek. Goose Creek is a little village way downstate, is it not? Way back in the hills. And at that time, what was the profession of this Pretorius? He was a doc. A doc? He healed people. How? If I knew how, I'd be a doc myself. I mean, what were his methods of treatment? Well, some healers use one thing and some use another. But Doc Pretorius used them all. Once he'd give a powder. Sometimes syrup, sometimes pills, sometimes a jab with a needle, and sometimes just talk. Just sit there and talk about a body's misery and talk a body into being well. Like working a miracle. Huh? A miracle worker too, eh? Well, if my grandma isn't a miracle, what is? Your grandma? Four times she laid down to die and four times he talked her up on her feet. Told her she was gonna live forever. Looks like he was right. Doc, healer, miracle worker, possible hypnotist. Check on narcotics administered. Now, Miss Pickett, are you completely certain that this man's name was Noah Pretorius? Would I make up a name like that? And is this Doc Pretorius by whom you were employed the same man as the famous Dr. Pretorius of this university and this city? Doc Pretorius was already as famous as you can get back in Goose Creek. He had people coming from miles around. But is he now the famous Dr. Pretorius? When you say doctor, do you mean school doctor out of books? That is precisely what I mean. Can't say. For my part, I wouldn't get caught dead in a room with one of them. Miss Pickett, I am a school doctor out of books. That's one reason why the door is open. This man. Is he the healer? The miracle worker? Is this Doc Pretorius? That's him. Only he looked younger 15 years ago. We all did. Not me. We come now, Miss Pickett, to the most important subject of all. What can you tell me about a man named Shunderson? Who did you say? Shunderson. Hello? It's, uh, it's Hoskins, Professor Elwell. Well, in case, perhaps, Professor Elwell, you'd forgotten, uh, the class is still waiting. Oh, yes, Professor, of course. No, 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 not at all. It's, it's just that, well, uh, Dr. Pretorius is also waiting to see you. Dr. Pretorius? To see me? Well. Well, he'll have to wait, too. But not for long, eh, Miss Pickett? What's the matter with you? What's in this for me, Professor Elwell? I thought that Sergeant Coonan had made it quite clear. He said you wanted some information from me, but also that you were going to give me a job. That's right. What kind of a job? In the dissecting rooms, as sort of a housekeeper. What I want to know is, will the job be worth it? Will the job be worth what, Miss Pickett? Shunderson. Tell me about him. I didn't know very much. Nobody did. Tell me everything you knew or heard. Every detail. He 
You're a professor, and it's hard to make you understand anything that ain't in a book. Well, most of what goes on in the world ain't in a book. Spare me your philosophy. What about Shunderson? To begin with, we used to call him the Bat. Did it ever occur to you, Shunderson, that skeletons always laugh? Now, why? Why should a man die and then laugh for the rest of eternity? What news, Uriah? I've just spoken with Professor Elwell, Doctor. He regrets exceedingly that he is unavoidably detained. A meaningless phrase, which could signify anything from oversleeping to being arrested for malpractice. I've never known the professor to be late before. Mm, he'd be the last to tolerate it in anyone else. Ah, it saddens me, Uriah. An unmistakable symptom of human weakness. Professor Elwell, of all men. Have you your notebooks ready? I would be quite unable to give the lecture you came to hear, and I'm not sure you should hear the lecture I'd like to give. Well, we want to hear anything you've got to say, Dr. Pretorius. That's very flattering, thank you. We thank you, the cadaver and I. A cadaver in a classroom. As students of medicine, it's important at the outset that you realize that a cadaver in a classroom is not a dead human being. I don't understand that, Doctor. Anatomy is more or less the study of the human body. The human body is not necessarily the human being. Here lies a cadaver. The fact that she was not long ago a living, warm, lovely young girl is of little consequence in this classroom. He would not be required to dissect and examine the love that was in her, or the hate, or the hope, despair, memories and desires that motivated every moment of her existence. They ceased to exist when she ceased to exist. Instead, for weeks and months to come, you would dissect, examine and identify her organs, bones, muscles, tissues and so on, one by one. And these you will faithfully record in your notebooks. And when the notebooks are filled, you will know all about this cadaver that the medical profession requires you to know. Oh! Oh! Get back! Get back! Don't touch her! Quiet down! Quiet down! Quiet down. The Super Cub Scouts would know better than the crowd like this. Back up. Have you any idea why you fainted? Have you ever fainted before? How do you feel? Silly. I think you better tell a doctor about this. There may be a reason. Can you get up now? Good. Perhaps you better go somewhere and relax. You go with her. And you know, if you insist upon studying anatomy, I suggest you do not sit on the aisle. Have a candy. Thank you. You're not leaving, Doctor. Yes, you are. And please give my thanks to Professor Elwell for the use of the hall. It's been fun. Oh, I can't understand his not being here. It's most unusual. It's an unusual world, Uriah. I understand I've kept you waiting. Please forgive me. It was most urgent business. My business, on the other hand, was the idlest of curiosity. You were going to let me know about a tumor you'd found. Ah, yes. A malignant dysgerminoma. Professor Elwell, you are the only man I know who can say malignant the way other people say bingo. A malignant dysgerminoma. Good day, Professor Elwell. Good day. Come 
coming back in? Mm-mm. Aren't you going back at all? Mm-mm. Are you going to see a doctor? I guess so. Run another test. How was she when you made this one? Depressed? Cried all through it. Uh, well, when you run it again, call me. We'll have a laugh through the next one. See what happens with a different set of emotional factors. Well, if you like. Dr. Pretorius, a problem's come up about Mrs. Bixby. Mrs. Bixby? I thought she was doing so well. She's nearly ready to go home, but she wants to take her gallbladder with her in a bottle of alcohol. Oh, I think that's quite touching. Let her have it. Dr. Pretorius, you know we don't keep gallbladders lying about once they've been removed. Mrs. Pegworth, so it's highly unlikely that Mrs. Bixby would recognize her own, so why don't you just give her any old gallbladder and make her happy? Doctor, unless all of the patients are served breakfast at the same time, I cannot operate the kitchen with our present personnel. Then hire more people to work in the kitchen. But it is common practice in hospitals. There's still more in my clinic. No patient shall be wakened from a health-giving sleep and forced to eat breakfast at a time which pleases a culinary union. But in the interest of good economy... Bad therapy is never good economy. If you must economize, do it in the doctor's dining room. And I will not have all the patients bathed at the stroke of a gong for the convenience of the nurses. One of the reasons for my founding this clinic is a firm conviction that patients are sick people, not inmates. Of hmm? course, Dr. Pretorius. I bet I know what you're thinking. Here comes Dr. Happiness, the good humor man. If he tries to cheer me up, so help me, I'll hit him with an ice bag, right? Wrong. Not that I blame him. One of the few pleasures of being sick is the right to feel good and miserable, and don't let any doctor tell you differently. I was thinking, it's not much fun when you get to be old. Oh, it's even less fun if you don't get to be old. I want to die. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Just lie around in the coffin all day with nothing to do. How was last night? Just fine, Doctor. Well, if we have another good night tonight, maybe tomorrow morning we'll go back into surgery and take another look. Doctor, does it hurt when you die? Not a bit. Where'd you get that idea? They tell me there's so much pain. Oh. Did anyone who actually died ever tell you that? <laughs> of course not. Well, there you see. All this silly gossip about dying. You know, I nearly died once, when I was a kid. The doctors gave me up for lost. The nerve of some doctors giving people up for lost as though they found them in the first place. Anyway, I was dying, and I was in a coma. You know how it felt? You know, how? It was winter at the time. And I felt as if I was flying very slowly in a sled high up in the sky. And the world below was covered in snow and ice and bitter cold. But I was warm and cozy in the back of the sled, wrapped in an ermine blanket. And then I came out of the coma, I came back to life. How'd you feel? Awful, I had a splitting headache and I vomited for three days. I've never felt as good being alive as I did when I was dying. You, you certainly make dying a pleasure, Dr. Pretorius. Mm, well, we'll keep that our little secret, shall we? I wouldn't want that to get around. Doctor? Are you feeling all right? Just my usual twilight sadness. Did it ever strike you that days die pretty much the way people do? Fighting for every last minute of light before they give up to the dark? You think about the strangest things, Doctor. It's my unbalanced diet. Who's waiting? Just one patient left, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Higgins. She was in earlier today. You had Dr. Beecham run a test and uh. told her to come back. Here's the laboratory report. Thank you. Well, the day will die on a happy note, at any rate. Have Mrs. Higgins come in. Mrs. Higgins?
Pardon me for getting up. It's the only exercise I take. Sit down, won't you? Mrs. Higgins, as a doctor, it's my duty, if at all possible, to find something for you to worry about. However, I cannot repudiate a laboratory report such as I hold in my hand. Mrs. Higgins, you have nothing to worry about. You mean everything is all right? Perfect. Then the fainting this morning, it, it didn't mean a thing, did it? Nothing out of the ordinary. You might eat lightly, however, on the days you dissect cadavers. Oh, that? I've given that up. I wasn't really a medical student anyway, just sitting in on some courses. Well, I imagine it'll be more fun just sitting home with Mr. Higgins. Yes. Yes, it will be. I can't say how grateful I am to you, Dr. Pretorius. But just a routine examination, after all, it didn't exactly save your life. Thank you, anyway. Not at all. Now, uh, Mrs. Higgins, don't forget to have Miss James give you another appointment in about a month. In about a month? To see you? Of course, if you can afford it, it might be preferable to have a regular obstetrician. In that case, there are several I'd be pleased to recommend. But, but didn't you say that I had nothing to worry about? That everything was all right? It couldn't be any better, Mrs. Higgins. You're pregnant. Are you sure? I mean, couldn't there be some mistake? There's always a possibility of error. However, with a result as positive as this, that possibility is remote. After all, it wasn't a very thorough test. I mean, it only took a couple of hours. I, I thought in order to be sure, you had to wait weeks. Not anymore. Nowadays, we find out about everything a lot more quickly than we used to. About life and even about death. Now, they used to use a little pink rabbit for the pregnancy test. But now they use a frog. Not nearly as cute, but it's a lot faster. Only two hours and just as certain. The name of the frog, by the way, is Rana Pippians. Sounds like a movie star, doesn't it? You're not married. What about the baby's father? It has no father. Well, that would be the first time in the annals of biology. I have no husband. But when he knows about the baby... He'll never know. I got a telegram the other day. The other day. Seems as if he left just the other day. Seems as if we met just the other day. It's all such a crazy, mixed-up nightmare. He was in the reserve, the medical corps. That's why I took the courses when he came back and we were married. I, I wanted to know something about his work. When did he leave? Six weeks ago. Or was it five? How right you are, Doctor. How quick we've become with life and death. And had you known him long? No, not even that. Not even long enough to be sure, either of us. You're not permitted enough time these days to be sure of anything. And then when he had to go, and we had to say goodbye, I was suddenly afraid. I wanted to prove to myself and to him that I wasn't afraid. Mm. The frightening things we do sometimes when we're afraid to be afraid. Sit down, why don't you? What are you afraid of now? I'm not. Then stop behaving as if fear was something to be ashamed stop of. Stop being such a pompous know-it-all. You don't even know what I'm crying about. Do you? Yes! Miss Higgins. I can't call you Miss Higgins. What's your first name? Deborah. Blow your nose. There's tissue in the top drawer. No, no, here. Well, I can't speak with as much assurance as I usually do because you just called me a pompous know-it-all. I'm sorry. Don't be. I do get pompous. But I'm really not a know-it-all. As a matter of fact, right now I'm confused. By what? Well, it seems to me that if you were crying because of the father of your baby, the time for you to cry would have been when you thought you weren't pregnant. Not now that you know you are. Isn't that so? So? He isn't the reason. No, he isn't. And were you crying because you're afraid for yourself? Afraid of what people will say? No. Are you sure? Society has a strict set of rules about that sort of thing. The bylaws of our social corporation. You violated Section A, Article 1. That can bring heavy penalties up to and including expulsion. You really think I'm a coward, don't you? Are you? No. Which brings us to the party of the third part, the baby. Are you crying because of the baby? You can't say there won't be time enough for you to love your baby. And if you're a good mother, to have it love you. 
it is the baby you're afraid of. In a way. Don't you want it? Of course I do, but I can't have it. I just can't have it. Why not? Why not, Deborah? You couldn't understand. I could try. Because of my father. You can never tell about fathers. They can be suddenly understanding at the most unexpected times. He's the most understanding and most gentle man in the world. Well, then? I'm all he's got. If he knew about this, it would kill him. Oh. Well, if you're all he's got, then the baby will give him just that much more. He couldn't live if he knew. Deborah. No man could be as gentle and understanding as you say, and still so deeply prejudiced It's got that... nothing to do with prejudice. Then what has it to do with? Perhaps, this is only a suggestion, but perhaps if I were to tell him... No. It's possible I could put it to him in such a way No, that... please. It's very kind of you, but you mustn't even consider it. Dr. Pretorius, believe me, if you did see my father, you couldn't tell him about me. Even you wouldn't know how. And if you did... You wouldn't have the heart. Thanks, just the same. What are you going to do? I don't know. You had a pretty good idea, didn't you, even before you came to see me that you were having a baby? I wasn't sure. Tell me, of all the doctors you could have gone to, why did you pick me? There wasn't anyone else I could. Well, when you talked to us this morning, I felt suddenly that you could help me somehow. How? Oh. You seem to care so much more about people than just any doctor would, and so... So you came to me for help, and all I did was talk to you some more. There is nothing I wanted from you, Dr. Pretorius, that would have affected your conscience in any way. Not even the tiniest hope that, uh, perhaps for your father's peace of mind? I wouldn't want to buy my father's peace of mind at the cost of yours. Did Miss Higgins make another appointment? Miss Higgins? Sorry, I meant Mrs. Higgins, of course. No, Doctor. She left without saying a word. Sometimes, Shunderson, it seems to me that half the women who come in here want babies they can't have, and that the other half... She's old enough to know what she's doing, and to take what's coming to her. I never want to hear you say anything as idiotic and heartless as that again. But, Doctor, For one I thing, you're a nurse, and for another, you're a woman. I'm ashamed of both of you. Have her taken to the nearest treatment room. You prepare her yourself. Left side, flesh wound. Doesn't look too bad. Get Billings for intravenous anesthesia. Yes, Doctor. Thank you, Billings. Yes, Doctor. Shall I have her taken to the ward, Doctor? Yes, and get some blankets, please. Is it bad? Mm -hmm. It's a good thing most people have the foggiest notion where the heart is actually located. She didn't even come close. Why'd she try to kill herself? Uh, I imagine, Shunderson, that when people need help the most, it must sometimes seem as if they're all alone in the world. Isn't that true? Then she'll try it again. She's still all alone. And if there's still nobody to help her, she'll try it again.
into the mixed coil. How are they coming along? Just fine, Dr. Pretorius. They're ready to start with you any time now. Good, the sooner the better. Set the first full rehearsal for next week. Well, tonight for the first time your attack was not pre-medical. The horns did not sound as if they'd been sterilized. The second fiddle still pull a little. You're still inclined to regard the strings as catgut for sewing rather than for playing. And as for the gentleman on the third bull fiddle, Professor Barker, is there any reason why you, Professor Barker, who live so intimately with millions of neutrons and know them all by name, cannot maintain a simple beat on a bull fiddle? Are you referring to me? I do not mean to impugn your academic standing, of course. My dear Dr. Pretorius, I would willingly entrust the life of my sister to your skill as a gynecologist but I would not let you conduct my three-year-old nephew to the bathroom. <laughs> the point is that I am the conductor of this orchestra, that you pay no attention to me. I do pay attention. Very well, we shall see. Start at letter B, please, Professor Barker, just your part alone. It's going to sound a little silly. After all, the bass viol is not a solo instrument. On the contrary, for one, Serge Kusevitsky has concertized as a virtuoso of the bass viol. Look who's talking about Kusevitsky. <laughs> Ready? Tell me, Professor, do the neutrons bombard the electrons or do the electrons do it to the neutrons? <laughs> Same time next week. Thank you and good night, all. You drive my car home. I'll ride with Professor Barker. Or oh, leave the Canuck first and the rest on the kitchen table. I'll cook them. I don't want you to wait up. You'll make me very unhappy if you don't go straight to bed. He gets up before I do and won't go to bed till I'm asleep. I keep forgetting he can't stand these long hours anymore. Noah. There's something I want to talk to you about. Here and now? Well, it's fresh on my mind. Just for a minute. Sit down. You behave as if you were about to propose. Noah, one of the differences between matter and mankind is that in matter, all relationships can be stated. 
whereas between people they can rarely be put into words. Granted. Now, I want you to know that I'm your good and devoted friend. I've been aware of that for some time, and I am yours. Therefore, I have the right to point out to you that there are occasions when you behave like a cephalic idiot. Also granted, any particular occasion. Out of a universe full of time and space, only you could pick Rodney Elwell's anatomy class. Uh, the good word gets around, doesn't it? Don't take this lightly, Noah. There's been trouble brewing. Talk of rummaging about in your past. Let them rummage. They're spitting into the wind. And all this talk about charges and whatnot, of an investigation. Noah, as a friend, tell me, can Elwell dig up anything in your past that would conceivably discredit you enough to justify, say, a hearing before a faculty committee? How much discredit is enough? I've known you intimately for 10 years, and I can't even guess at what you were up to the day before I met you. Suppose I told you all. Could it affect our friendship? Of course not. I'm glad to hear that. You know, it's not much to have a friend who knows all about you. But one who's a friend, even though he's not quite sure, that's worth having. Then will you tell me just this? About the bat. The bat? I thought you knew that's what they call him. Shanderson. Who calls him that? Why, the, the students, the faculty, even the staff at your own clinic. No, I didn't know. It's not a proper name for him. Noah, who is he? A man named Shunderson. Where does he come from? Why is he with you day and night, everywhere you go? I have no right to tell even you anything about Mr. Shunderson. Can Elwell uncover something about his past, or yours, or both, that he can use to make trouble? That depends. Drop me by the clinic first, will you? I want to look in on a patient. Don't turn the light on, please. You've been crying again. That doesn't necessarily follow. Well, it's a pretty good guess when a woman wants the light kept off. Either that or her face isn't on. I don't mind being seen without makeup. I don't mind seeing you without makeup. You know all about women, don't you? Not nearly enough. I don't mean just as a doctor. Not even as a doctor. Deborah, I, uh, I've got something to tell you. And as a pompous know-it-all... I didn't mean that even when I said it. As a pompous know-it-all, it isn't going to be easy. But do you remember the remote possibility that I thought could never occur about the frog being wrong? Well, the frog wasn't wrong. But you've got the wrong frog. It seems the possibility of a laboratory assistant making a mistake is not remote at all. I don't understand. Two tests were being run at the same time. One had a positive result and the other negative. Through unforgivable negligence, your report read positive when it should have read negative. Then 
I'm not having a baby after all. You're not having a baby after all. Sleep well. You've got nothing to worry about. That's what you think. Now what are you crying about? It's just awful. What is? To think I had to go and tell you all about myself and what I did. Now it turns out I didn't really have to. Well, it did you good to have someone to tell it to. But not to you. Why not? I'll see you in the morning, Deborah. Dr. Pretorius. Mm? Are all your patients women? Almost. I guess they all fall in love with you. Not all of them. Just most. Not even most. Good night. Why do you have to stop by the clinic? Anything interesting? A physician respects the confidence of his patients and does not discuss them with anyone. How true, how true. Was it the young girl who tried to shoot herself? Mm -hmm. Why? Because of an unpremeditated baby. Her condition pretty bad? Better than yours on the whole, just a superficial flesh wound. Then why drive all the way up to the clinic to see her? I wanted to tell her she was not pregnant. Lost the baby, huh? Was it shot or when she fell? She's as pregnant now as she ever was. And why in the name of good sense tell her that she isn't? Pregnancy, my dear boy, is not a state of the mind. Here, get me some of Macrosh. Two reasons. One, to get her a good night's sleep. And the second, to keep her from trying it again until I can find her father and talk with him. What has her father got to do with it? Well, she has an unshakable conviction that the knowledge of what she has done will kill her. Do you intend to talk him into clicking his heels with joy over the situation? I intend to convince him either to be compassionate about it or to convince her that her father will survive her disgrace and that her chief responsibility is to the baby. Noah, yeah? has it ever occurred to you, aside from certain medical considerations, that most of this is none of your business? Thanks. No? What is my business? To diagnose the physical ailments of human beings and to cure them. Wrong. My business is to make sick people well. There's a vast difference between curing an ailment and making a sick person well. We won't go into that. I'm too tired. Besides, doctors bore me. Just one little question. What have you great men of science done with atomic energy to make people well? Hmm? That's wonderful sauerkraut. It tastes like sauerkraut used to taste. Mm. There's a German woman who makes it in a barrel. I'll send you some. More beer? Yes, please. Sauerkraut belongs in a barrel, not a can. Our American mania for sterile packages has removed the flavor for most of our foods. Butter is no longer sold out of wooden tubs, and a whole generation thinks butter tastes like paper. There was never a perfume like an old-time grocery store. Now they smell like drugstores. They don't even smell like drugstores anymore. You country doctors live romantic lives. Just think, it might be quintuplets. This time of the morning is usually heartburn or loneliness. Hello? Dr. Pretorius? Dr. Pretorius, one of our patients is missing. Miss Higgins. That's it, Deborah Higgins. It must have been in the last hour, Doctor. Miss Myers said Miss Higgins was sleeping when she made her rounds about an hour ago. We've searched the grounds. Doctor, I just can't imagine how she got out. I can tell you exactly how she got out. By walking down the corridor and out the front door, just as I did a couple of hours ago. No, don't notify the police. I'll take care of it in the morning. Keep looking, of course. And let me know if you find her. Good night. Who flew the coop? The young lady we were discussing? Yeah. Why would she run away? I don't know. But I've got to find her. I should think so. It seems you've got some important information about her that she hasn't got.
You'd better wait in the car while I ask. I wondered what Beelzebub was barking at. Beelzebub. Beasts like that are usually called pals. I call him Beelzebub because he's an evil dog. Well, I am delighted to meet someone courageous enough not to love all dogs. My name is Pretorius. Dr. Pretorius? This is a pleasure. I'm Arthur Higgins. I'm delighted Beelzebub didn't frighten you away, but I am surprised he gave up so easily. Mr. Shunderson has a way with dogs. Mr. Shunderson? How do you do? Won't you come sit down? Thank you. You're far from a stranger to me, Dr. Pretorius. I've heard so much about you from my daughter, Deborah. Have you? How fortunate you were such good friends when she had that ridiculous little accident. Yes, it was ridiculous, wasn't it? I still do not understand how a woman can accidentally burn a deep welt in her side with a curling iron. Well, it's not uncommon for women, female students in particular, to curl their hair, eat, read, and telephone all at the same time. The results are often disastrous. Yes, I imagine it could have been worse. Much worse. I happen to be devoted to porch sitting. If you'd rather go inside... Oh, this is very pleasant. And I see that you're properly protected against too much fresh air. Don't you believe in the benefits of fresh air? I do not. Nor do I believe that eating fish develops the brain or that oysters will increase virility. <laughs> well, you must tell that to Deborah. She's forever driving me out of the house. You're an unusual man of science, Dr. Pretorius. You're an unusual farmer, Mr. Higgins. But I'm not a farmer. This isn't my farm. It belongs to my brother. I see. Then you're just visiting here. You might say, I'm staying here. We need help. Beelzebub crawled in under the ice house and he won't come out. Beelzebub belongs under the ice house. Deborah, we have guests. Yes, I, I see. Hello, Doctor. Hello, Mr. Shunderson. I was wondering about that nasty little burn you got from the curling iron. It's fine. Well, it's been almost a week, and since we happen to be driving out this way... Happen to be out this way? Hours from your clinic and the university? Dr. Pretorius has far-flung interests. Then I'm sure both he and Mr. Shunderson will be interested in joining us for Sunday dinner. No, really, we couldn't impose upon you. Dr. Pretorius must have more important matters... Nonsense. We can't let them drive miles to get here and send them away unfed. We'd love to have you. We'll be happy to stay. I'll tell Bella. Have you been here long? Your father and I have just been getting acquainted. Dr. Pretorius has a way of knowing people very well, very quickly. He's entitled to as much time as he wants. After all, you've told me so much about him. Father, I'm not at all sure that it's good for you to be out of doors. There is nothing healthier than fresh air. You said something about telling Bella? I haven't the slightest intention of leaving here. Bella! It seems also that Deborah has told me a great deal about you, Mr. Higgins. There wasn't much to know, was there? The number of accomplishments in my life, Doctor, is one, Deborah. Quite an accomplishment. If you don't mind, I'd rather not be discussed this intimately on the front porch. On the front porch, you're in a test tube. It is obvious that you're going to be discussed. So why do you insist upon remaining where you're not wanted? Well, why should you want to discuss me? There's, there's nothing to discuss, is there? 
Deborah? Dr. Pretorius has not driven this great distance to see Beelzebub or to inquire whether you're being more careful with your curling iron. It's quite apparent that he's come to talk with me. Now, go and tell Bella there will be two extra for dinner. Somebody yelled for me? Yes, Bella. These two gentlemen are staying for dinner. Mr. John know about it? There's plenty of food. Mr. John better know about it. I'll tell him. He's doing his books now, and he don't like to be disturbed. I'll tell him when he's finished, Bella. Well, I'll put two plates on anyway. You left the peas half done. I'll be right in. I would like to help. Oh, Mr. Saunders. Oh, really, it isn't necessary. Don't let him. It's a good idea. He'll be of great help. May I ask, is Mr. Shunderson your servant? He's my friend, but he likes to help. I see. Uh, Dr. Pretorius, I referred a moment ago to Deborah as the only accomplishment of my life. I'm sure you were being modest. Oh, she's more than my only accomplishment. Quite simply, she's my only contact with and reason for what is sometimes described as life. If you'll permit a rather lurid analogy, Deborah is my heartbeat. Mr. Higgins, please don't feel that you have to tell no, me anything. No, no, I want to tell you about myself for just a moment. I can't say what makes me want to. Perhaps it was Bella's rudeness. Perhaps because I think of you already as a friend. Uh, have you got a match? No. I smoke too much anyway. The Mr. John Bella seems so concerned about is my brother. He owns this farm. He owns the food I invited you to share, the beds we sleep in, the clothes we wear, Deborah's tuition, and the tobacco in my pipe. The pipe is mine. I have other possessions, some scrapbooks, thin volume of poetry, mine too. It was published, but <laughs> didn't sell, of course. And Deborah, and the memory of my wife. I wondered about her. She died when Deborah was very little in London. That's where Deborah was born. What were you doing in London? I did the same thing, Dr. Pretorius, in most of the major cities of the world. I failed miserably at whatever it was I tried to do. We haven't any matches. What? Oh, it's become a nervous habit, I guess. My brother, John, never left this farm physically, mentally, spiritually, or in any other fashion. I don't imagine John's been more than 100 miles from this porch in any given direction. When you left the farm, what did you set out to be? Nothing in particular, except to be as far from here as possible. I remained both throughout my life, far from here and nothing in particular. I was an indifferent journalist, a minor poet, an ineffective teacher, a wretched businessman, unable to provide properly for my wife and child, and then not even for just my child. When my heart gave way, it seemed to me that my functions had achieved a unanimous failure. And so I applied to my brother for permission to return here with Deborah as a complete dependent, which I am in every sense of the word, including being listed as such in his income tax report. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll ask John about dinner. Perhaps it would be better if you didn't. Please, I'd consider it a favor. Would you like to come inside? No, I'll stay out here for another minute. I thought you were helping in the kitchen. The woman didn't want me. I can't say I approve of the company you keep. The dog is frightened and unhappy. He has that in common with most of humanity. It's not going to be easy, what you came here for. 
Let's go for a walk. Sunday ain't Sunday without chicken. Two things I guess I did every Sunday in my life, go to church and eat chicken. Don't you ever eat chicken on a weekday? Only on Sundays. But if you like chicken so much, why don't you eat it more often? Because I only eat it on Sundays. Uncle John lives according to a very strict schedule. Two things I live by, the good book and the calendar. I got a day's work to do every day in the year. I take care of my work and the good book takes care of me. Then you do the same thing every day of every year, is that it? Just like the cows and horses and vegetables. That's right. That's what the good Lord and old Mother Nature put us here for, to do the job they set out for us. Oh. Well, I can't speak for the good Lord, of course, but I know a little about old Mother Nature. If old Mother Nature had her way, there wouldn't be a human being alive. How do you mean that? I mean, among other things, that old Mother Nature tries to destroy us periodically by means of pestilence, disease, and disaster. That's why the human race has been at war with old Mother Nature ever since it became the human race. What do you mean, became the human race? Is that what you teach? No, and I'm not really a teacher. That merely happens to be my opinion. Mm. You make a lot of money? John, really, I don't think you... I don't mind telling him. Yes, Mr. Higgins, I make a lot of money as a doctor, but then I'm one of the few fortunate ones. <laughs> I'll see. We got one here in town, works night and day. I haven't got a red cent. If you had a teacher here in town, he'd be a little worse off than even your doctor. But then the government doesn't pay them for the patients they don't treat or the children they don't teach. Oh, you mean like uh, I get paid for not growing some crops? I never could figure that one out. But then I uh, never ask too many questions about it. Never look a gift horse in the mouth. You? I never look any horse in the mouth. Hmm. Well, I'm going back to working on my books. Then I'm going to sleep a while till it's time for my radio programs. Off my schedule today, income tax. I ain't complaining, though. Got more deductions than I thought. Doc, do you mind if I put you and your friend down as a couple of feed salesmen? Flattered. Just don't call me Doc. That way I deduct the whole dinner. Every little bit helps. I write it all down in a book. Most of my equipment don't cost me a thing, writing it off year by year. What's it called, Arthur? Depletion and depreciation. Yeah, that's it. Means it's running down. Don't work so good as it did. One thing about teachers and writers and such. They have less bother with their income tax than farmers and oil well owners. That's so? Why? Because their equipment is talent and a highly developed mind. And when they run down and don't work so good as they did, the depletion and depreciation can't be written off their income tax. See what I mean? What's so smart about him? Don't play the radio loud while I'm sleeping, Arthur. No, John. Deborah, why don't you show Dr. Pretorius the farm? I'm sure he'd be interested. Just a lot of depletion and depreciation, that's all. Let's see it before it's all written off. I'll get a sweater and meet you outside. How old were you when you learned to walk? I did pretty well by the time I was four. When did you leave the farm? I was 16. It couldn't have taken you 12 years to make up your mind. You enjoy music, Mr. Shunderson? More than anything. Mr. Shunderson, Dr. Pretorius has come here to ask Deborah to marry him, hasn't he? I wouldn't be surprised. This, as you see, is the dairy. The cows are out in the pasture. 
doing the job the good Lord gave them. Uncle has eight cows. It's far more milk, butter, and cheese than what we need. He sells the rest in town. That makes it a commercial enterprise. And he can write off the dairy and the equipment and the cows. I think I like the dairy best of all. It's certainly spotless, isn't it? The Board of Health is very strict about that. Where'd you hide Bella when they come around? Under the ice house? Down here. This room is for the separator and things. I'd stay out of there if I were you. You might get caught in a room with a dead end. The milk gets certified, you know. According to the amount of butter fat in it. Why did you run away from the clinic? And this, of course, is the separator, where the cream gets separated from the milk. Why did you run away? It works by centrifugal action. It used to be done by just skimming it off. But the cream, being lighter than the milk, rises to the surface. Deborah. Because I had to. Why? I had to, that's all. Why? Because. Why? I had reasons. What? They were private and personal. I don't have to tell you everything. Why? I'm in love with you. What makes you think so? I can't give you symptoms. It's love, not measles. Am I being pompous again? Well, there are some things you can't be scientific about. Even so, why should that make you want to run away in the middle of the night in your bathrobe and slippers? I didn't want to see you the next morning. I wanted to see you. Not if I knew about you what you knew about me, you wouldn't want to. Possibly, I don't know. A person just doesn't fall in love that fast, or that often. I just couldn't lie there anymore and think about it. I couldn't stand it. Don't you see, if I do love you, then how could I have been in love with him? And if I didn't love him, then why? And anyway, even if I did, why did I have to go and tell you about it? You crying again? No, but I want to run away again. No, no more running away. No, you were right about your father. I couldn't have told him. He'd have understood, but I couldn't have told him. Certainly you couldn't have. Now you tell me something. Why did you come here? What do you mean? It couldn't have been to talk to my father. Well, as a matter of fact, it... Because if it was, what about? There wasn't anything to tell him, really, was there? Well, no, not really. It was a just a... superficial that... flesh wound like mine. You weren't worried about my condition, were you? Well, of course not. I... Going to all the trouble of finding me, searching the registrar's records and whatnot. Why did you come all the way out here? I don't know, really. I think you do know. What's your first name? I can't go on calling you Dr. Pretorius. Uh, Noah. Why did you come after me, Noah? You know, what you said before about cream being lighter than milk, that wasn't quite accurate. Noah is a cute uh, name. My real name is Ludwig. You see, cream is the oily part of the milk. It's not actually a separate product. Mm, I prefer Noah. In homogenizing milk, for instance, the uh, particles of fat become emulsified. I do not want to appear unladylike about this, but I'd feel silly acting coy. So that the cream becomes part of the general body of the milk. With you of all men. You couldn't have come out here because you wanted to talk to my father. And you couldn't have come out because you were worried about my health. And there comes a time when a patient asks a doctor questions. Why did you come all this way just to see me, Noah? I did have a reason, you know. I know. No, you don't. But it doesn't seem to matter at the moment. You're being pompous again at the moment. You'd be surprised how unpompous. Then what are you being? do have a way of happening, don't they? Old Mother Nature. Old Mother Nature knows best.
What's Uncle John up to? He's got the radio on full blast. Something about rustlers. It seems somebody rustled 15,000 television sets. Here, <laughs> use this. Dropping my things out of the window. You'd think I was escaping from a girl's reformatory. There is no reason why we can't just walk out the front door. It's more fun this way. When are you going to break the news to the gentleman farmer? John, during his favorite quiz program, I intend to let him have it as a personal jackpot. He'll be mad. I hope so. I am scared. Deborah, I thought I was going to have to die without seeing you safely out of here and without telling him off. Remember your promise to come and live with us. Of course he will. Much against everybody's better judgment, including my own, I intend to live very happily with you. I'm still scared. There's nothing that John can do to either of us. Oh, she's not scared of John. She's scared of me. Pompous know-it-all. It just so happens that what I'm afraid of is that you don't really want to marry me and, and that I won't make you a good enough wife. In the first place, I'm not in the habit of marrying women I don't really want to marry. His first name isn't Noah, you and, know. It's Ludwig. And in the second place... A woman has yet to be born who doesn't in her heart believe she'll make her husband a much better wife than he has any possible right to expect. I just don't want to get married tonight. I don't want a long engagement, but can't I even have one day? We'll be married in New York. That takes three days. All right? It's just so I can feel more feminine about it. I must say you're the only man I ever heard of who acts exactly like some poor girl that has to get married. I imagine that as a man, I've come as close to it as any other man who ever lived. I got it, Professor. Sergeant Coonan. I got your man. Excellent. Is that the same Shunderson? Very probably. Could you identify him from this? Almost positively. You got to do better than Barry and almost. My dear man, this newspaper appeared in 1917. The photograph is 34 years old at least. The identification may not be entirely positive, but it satisfies me. We gotta be sure. Get me a new picture of this character. There are none that I know of. Mr. Shunderson has always manifested a violent aversion to being photographed, even to snapshots by students. Want me to handle it? Please. Okay. Comes tomorrow, we slap a tail on this monkey. Mr. Coonan, I have spoken to you about this before. I must be able to understand you. Oh. What I mean is, starting tomorrow, we have him followed. Unhappily, it'll have to wait until Monday. Dr. Pretorius is undermining a medical convention in New York and will not return until then. Monday it is. Good luck to you. May I be of service to you, madam? Yes, you may. I want to buy an electric train outfit. Very fancy and very elaborate. It's for a birthday. Oh, I'm sure we can find something nice. May I ask how old is the boy? 41. He'll be 42 tomorrow. Anything the matter? No, I, I, I thought I saw a friend. Well, if you'd like to come. No, it doesn't matter. Then would you help me with the trains? We've got more equipment than the Union Pacific. Sure. Good night, Doctor Victoria. Good night. Good night, Doctor. Good night. I think you should know. Someone took my picture today. Give me one to wear in a locket around my neck. It wasn't that kind. He ran away after he took it. I see. Perhaps it would be better if I went away too. No. You've made a great career. You have a home now, a wife. 
responsibilities. No. Want me to answer, Mrs. Pretorius? Oh, don't bother, Anna. Mr. Shunderson's somewhere out front. He'll get it. Professor Elwell from the university. At this time of day, what about? He's come to see Dr. Pretorius in very urgent business. Shall I call him? Certainly not. Dr. Pretorius is not to be disturbed. I'll talk to Professor Elwell. Good evening, Professor Elwell. Mrs. Pretorius? This is indeed an honor. I'd heard, of course, of Dr. Pretorius's marriage. But until now, I had no knowledge of the extent to which he was to be complimented upon his exquisite taste. Thank you, Professor. How sweet of you to come all this way just to say those nice things. Won't you sit down? Thank you. No, my business is with Dr. Pretorius. A most urgent and confidential matter. And I have no wish to intrude for long upon what seems to be a festive occasion. His birthday. So, these must be happy days indeed for your husband. Unfortunately, they're busy days too, and at the moment he's in a very important conference. But surely if you were to tell him that a most pressing matter concerning the university... I'm afraid he cannot be disturbed. Mrs. Pretorius, I assure you that it is necessary for me to talk with him. It just is not possible. You're welcome to wait if you like, but I assure you my husband will be in conference until dinner time. I too have a home, Mrs. Pretorius. I have come here at no little inconvenience to myself. Exactly what have you come here for, Professor Elwell? I have a message for your husband. Not a happy one, I regret to say. Oh? Well, if you'll give it to me, I'll see that he gets it. Uh, I had hoped, uh, that is, I have been asked, to inform Dr. Pretorius of it in person. Has the message to do with some confidential information about a patient? It has to do only with your husband. Well, then in that case, it doesn't matter whether I tell him about it or he tells me. A relationship of... A relationship of such mutual trust is heartwarming. Thank you. You understand, of course, that my presence here is a matter of duty, not necessarily personal inclination. You are well known, Professor, as a man without personal inclinations. Thank you. May I have a glass of water? On the table. Help yourself. It's so beautifully arranged. Just drinking some water won't hurt it. You're extremely generous. Mrs. Pretorius, there have been for some time now persistent, uh, but obviously unreliable, rumors about your husband. About women? about the circumstances under which he has practiced medicine, about his methods, and certain events, both past and present. Oh, that. And uh, in view of certain disclosures, unfounded, of course, which have come to light recently concerning both Dr. Pretorius and his most intimate associate. My husband is intimate, only with me. The dean of our university has asked me to present to Dr. Pretorius a list of the charges that have been brought against him. Who brought these charges? Dean Brockwell invites your husband to disprove these charges. In confidence, of course. Should your husband be unwilling to accept this offer of a private hearing, then the dean will have no recourse other than to summon Dr. Pretorius before a faculty committee for an open discussion of the charges in question. They must be pretty serious. What are they? I'm not privileged to reveal them. But you know what they are. Unhappily, I do. This must be a great strain on you, Professor. The performance of one's duty in a profession founded upon such high standards of honor, dignity, uh, learning and ethics... One thing you can be sure of, my husband isn't going to sneak into the dean's office to clear his name in private. You drag those nasty, vicious rumors of yours right out into the open and get rid of them in the open where you've been spreading them. Uh, Mrs. Pretorius, you're not being objective. We are discussing my husband, not a kidney. You are also leaping at conclusions. All rumors need not necessarily be vicious and nasty. It depends upon the viewpoint. I am pretty well committed to one particular viewpoint, Professor. Quite so. Well, I must be going.
I admire your courage and faith. Most women would be perhaps apprehensive. Most women are not married to my husband. True. Whatever he did, he did for good and sufficient reason. Even if it turns out he murdered somebody. I have never had occasion to envy Dr. Pretorius. May I say that I envy him you? You have that right under the Constitution of the United States. Will you show the professor to the door, Mr. Shunderson? He's leaving. Thank you for your hospitality. Drop in any time. Give this to the miracle man. I'll take it to him. Lionel Barker. What happened? What happened? Did your train leave on beep beep or beep beep beep? Beep beep beep. Your signal was beep beep. Arthur signal was beep beep. Mine was beep beep beep. We'll soon find out about that. It was beep 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 and... What a bloody mess. And whose fault is it, my fine atomic friend? You can't go around smashing everything you see. You know everything is in atoms. Yes, it is. Not for smashing it isn't. Not in my house and not my train. Deborah, get out of the way before Professor Barker smashes you. He's on a smashing bag. Uh, don't. Beep, beep, beep. Those were your orders. Beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep. I told you so. Mine was beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep. Arthur, yours was beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep. Beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep. Now look, they're my trains and I'm the chief dispatcher. I know how I set them up. Beep from me, beep, beep from you, and beep, beep, beep from Arthur. What difference does it what make? What difference does it make? Look at this disaster. In case of disaster, the responsibility remains with the chief dispatcher. And in a catastrophe like this, he either resigns or blows his brains out. I refuse to be held accountable for the inability of two idiotic assistants to remember two simple signals. No, I consider your high-handed refusal to accept the testimony of two responsible men as worse than idiotic. Under the circumstances, I consider it criminal. Your signal was beep, 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 and you know it was beep, beep, beep. Noah! Deborah, I leave it to you, but remember your Deborah, I am your father, yes, and I am not related to you. I've been not on the to leave these various, various rooms at various times. But I'm not going to go on these tracks. I have to leave these rooms. I have to leave these rooms. He began to issue... Is this what you're crying about? Then what? It's 
just that I love you so much. And I went and put all those candles on that cake when you're really only nine years old. According to this document, I am not the picture of childish innocence you imagine me to be. Do you want to read it? No. Do you want me to tell you about it? Not if you think you shouldn't. Not if you think you shouldn't. Is a phrase used exclusively by women who assume a man's guilt without having the guts to come out and say so. Nothing could be less important to me than this whole business of rumors and charges against you. That's my girl. Just a minute. Oh, just from the type of men who attack you, anybody would know you were innocent. Anybody but half an eye. You haven't done anything you shouldn't have, have you, Noah? Many times. But not as a doctor. Don't let it worry you. I won't. Noah. Hmm? Does it seem to you that I cry a lot? Truthfully, darling, there's never been anything like it since the little Dutch boy took his finger out of the dike. He never took it out. That's what killed him. Pompous know-it-all. Never used to cry at all, you know. Oh, if I bump my head, something like that. But now the least little thing that happens, I start to bawl. Why do you suppose it is? Why do you suppose it is? Well, I get upset so easily these days, and, and I used to be, well, if anything, sort of calm, even placid about things. What did you say the name of that frog was? What frog? The one that gets pregnant in two hours. The frog doesn't get pregnant, darling. It just shows certain indications. Well, I'm beginning to show certain indications. Anyway, I think I am. I feel so silly talking to you about it. No, no, I understand. It's the kind of thing you'd rather discuss with a doctor. I don't pretend to be an expert about such things, but I've always thought I was a fairly normal adult young lady who knew roughly what every fairly normal adult young lady should know. Right now, I feel like a kind of idiot Elsie Dinsmore. What seems to be your problem, Mrs. Pretorius? I'm confused. I can't figure anything out. I'm all mixed up. Heaven knows, after all I've been through these past few weeks, I've got a right to be, but not this mixed up, not this confused. Married exactly two weeks and three days. Noah, darling, forgive me for being little Nell from the country about this, but is it possible that I could be having a baby already? Little Nell, Elsie Dinsmore, or Catherine the Great. It is entirely possible. Well, if it's possible, then you should be the first to know. It is also probable. Do you mind? Comes the dawn, I'll stand on that windowsill and crow. Comes the dawn next December, you'll be walking the floor with it. Next September. December, dear. September. Now you're getting mixed up. This is April, December. September. My dear Dr. Pretorius, unless they've changed the rules about how long it takes, or unless there's a new way to count, I make it December. Well, there's nothing wrong with the way you're counting. You're just not starting back far enough. Well, how can I possibly start any farther back than... No. Oh, no. You're quite a noble character, aren't you? I've never thought of myself as one particularly. No, really. I mean, I've heard of doctors who were self-sacrificing and unselfish. But apparently, there's no limit to yours. Deborah, you couldn't be more wrong. Were you that afraid I'd kill myself? How afraid is that afraid? Afraid enough to marry me, to keep me from it. Is it conceivable to you that I would? It seems obvious, doesn't it? You mean that as a doctor, I was faced by a situation which I could only meet by marrying you? that I did it as a remedy. Deborah, as you know, I believe in using any form of therapy that would make people well. But it would be highly impractical to make marrying my patients a standard form of treatment. Why did you marry me? Because I was in love with you. Is that why you came to the farm? To ask me to marry you? No. Not consciously, at any rate. Let's not mess with the unconscious right now. We've got enough conscious trouble to worry about. You fell in love all of a sudden, didn't you? All of a sudden. I'm still falling. Let me know when you hit bottom. Any time within the next 30 or 40 years. You came to the farm because you knew I was pregnant. And then you met my father and my uncle. And you understood 
why I tried to kill myself. But by that time, you were all mixed up in it because you told me that silly lie about the wrong frog. And I was so obviously in love with you. It was all over me like a tattoo. And so, with no possible way out for anybody, all of a sudden, you fell in love with me, and that solved everything. And everybody lived happily ever after. For two weeks and three days, that is until I found out that my baby isn't going to be yours. Funny. This calls for tears, and I haven't got any. I take it all back about my being normal and adult and lady. What makes you think it isn't going to be my baby? Because it isn't. Because its father is someone you never even knew, someone I can't even remember as well as I should. All of which, however true, has nothing to do with our baby. His interest in this world will begin as it does with all babies, when suddenly, through no fault of his own, he is rudely deprived of a warm, secure, and well-fed existence, which he has every reason to believe will go on forever, and finds himself upside down in the air, being smacked on the backside. Are you going to love him? Of course I am. So am I, and we'll keep him warm, and we'll feed him, and make him feel secure again, and give him brothers to play with. All boys, eh? Now, it's time you stopped thinking about yourself and started thinking about my baby. No, if you really suddenly fell in love with me. No, if. Why? I couldn't say why. Haven't you ever wondered? Falling as fast as I am, I don't have time. A man as exact as you with a reason for everything? Then I'll find it. Any time in the next 30 or 40 years, I'll start wondering. I won't be doing much else, it looks like, except wondering. But you and me, about you and the baby, me and my fine character. Are you feeling sorry for yourself? I'm feeling sorry for you. Don't be. I love you. Be that. Forgive me. Shut up. Love me. Dinner is served. I have forbidden you to bring that disgusting echo chamber into my house. As your friend, it Why is my is duty. It here? Am I not the master in my own house? To provide for your wife some contact with a world of sensitivity of which you have no knowledge. Here, here. A happy birthday to, to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. must have started. Why aren't you there? No, not yet, but in a second. Now, you mustn't be nervous. There's nothing to be worried about. Oh. Just see to it that they get it over with quickly. Such nonsense. May I? Thank you. How dare they hold their silly investigation the same night as the concert? It's unforgivable. It may be worse. From what I hear, Professor Elwell and his gang insisted upon it. They consider it unlikely that Noah will conduct if the hearing goes against him. The reasons for it could then hardly be kept confidential. The hearing will not go against him. And besides, Noah would conduct on his way to be hanged. Terribly sorry, gentlemen. Unavoidable. My apologies. Well, now that we're all here, shall we begin? It is my intention, gentlemen, to conduct this hearing informally. Dr. Pretorius, wouldn't you like to sit closer? Thank you. I prefer to remain as remote as possible. I suggested it merely to avoid having our discussion take on the appearance of a trial. I appreciate your thoughtfulness, but I consider this trial to be a trial. I have no intention of regarding an investigation of my methods and myself as a cozy little chat among friends. 
Hear, hear. <laughs> Professor Barker, I will have to insist that no one speak without being recognized by the chair. I am by nature a man who interrupts. However, I shall try. Thank you. Dr. Pretorius, may I suggest to begin with, in order to avoid both the embarrassment and time involved in examination, that you give of your own accord a pertinent account of your life and professional activities prior to your arrival in this city, in this university. I prefer to be questioned. Why? Because I do not intend to tell things about myself, of my own accord, which are nobody's business but my own. They are the concern of the entire medical profession. Uh-uh. Be recognized. You too, Professor Barker. Your objection is understandable, Dr. Pretorius. Professor Elwell, you may begin your questioning. My colleagues have appointed me to speak in their name. I hope I may prove worthy of what is not only an honor, but a grave responsibility. Dr. Pretorius, will you stipulate and agree to abide by the verdict of this committee? I would do nothing of the kind. Why not? Because I don't know what the verdict will be. The verdict will affect you seriously, whether you agree to abide by it or not. Then why ask idiotic questions to which you already know the answers? One horse on you, Elwell. Will you admit that in 1936, you were a highly successful quack and miracle healer in a remote little village in the southern part of this state? I will admit nothing of the kind. Where did you live in 1936? In Goose Creek. Would you describe Goose Creek as a thriving metropolis? It is a remote little village in the southern part of this state. Exactly. And uh, what was your source of income in Goose Creek in 1936? My practice. You practiced openly? I was available to anyone at any time. I mean to say, did you set up practice as a doctor of medicine? When I came to Goose Creek, I had my degree as a doctor of medicine. I did not, however, display my MD upon my door. Upon your shop door. I beg your pardon, his shop door. Isn't it true, Dr. Pretorius, that in that remote little village called Goose Creek, you opened a butcher shop? An honorable trade, if ever there was one. In itself, unimpeachable. But what did you sell in your butcher shop? Meat, at cost. At cost? Without profit? Then how did you make your living? I made sick people well. Uh-huh. Why should that startle you? I still do. Do you deny that at that time your patients were under the impression that you were a butcher and not a doctor? Do you prefer the impression given to their patients by so many of our colleagues that they are doctors and not butchers? Bravo! Bravo! Dr. Pretorius, won't you admit that your practice flourished in Goose Creek because you took advantage of the ignorance of its backward inhabitants? of the pathetic willingness of those poor people to rely upon a belief in miraculous cure rather than scientific knowledge, and because of the readiness with which so many people will prefer the glamorous quack to the licensed practitioner. Despite your definition of a quack as someone who does not practice medicine according to your rules, Professor Elwell, the fact remains that a quack is an unqualified person who pretends to be a doctor. I was a licensed practitioner and therefore not a quack. And as to the willingness of those so-called ignorant and backward people to rely upon the curative powers of faith and possibly miracles too, I consider faith properly injected into a patient as effective in maintaining life as adrenaline. And a belief in miracles has been the difference between living and dying as often as any surgeon's scalpel. That is not the issue under discussion. It is precisely the issue. Whether the practice of medicine shall become more and more intimately involved with the human beings it treats or whether it's to go on in this present way of becoming more and more a thing of pills, serums, and knives, until eventually we shall undoubtedly evolve an electronic doctor. The issue at hand is quite simply that you amassed a fortune by treating sick people who believed that you were a, a miracle-working butcher. I could not have amassed that fortune unless I had made an enormous number of sick people well. All this folder roll, as I see it, has got nothing to do with the ethics and honor of our profession. It has everything to do with envy of one man's genius for healing the sick, of his use of remedies you can't prescribe by in bottles or apply with a knife. Call Pretorius a psychiatrist, high priest, voodoo, medicine man, witch doctor, anything you like. But don't investigate him, gentlemen. Learn from him. Professor Barker, it was understood you would not interrupt. I'm sorry. You can strike my remarks from the record. I'm sure you all agree with me anyway, so... Why don't we call this whole silly thing off and, and start the concert?
It would interest me, Dr. Pretorius, to know why you ever left this lucrative practice in Goose Creek and under what circumstances. I'd always intended to leave when I'd acquired enough money to start a clinic of my own. As it turned out, I left a little sooner than I'd planned. You see, I'd fired my housekeeper. She was falsifying my grocery bills and splitting the money with the grocer. Unfortunately, she had previously discovered my medical diploma in the bottom drawer of my desk. In revenge for being fired, she let it be known around Goose Creek that I was not a butcher at all, but a licensed MD. I was confronted by a crowd of angry townspeople and forced to admit the truth. I narrowly escaped being run out of town on a rail. Any more questions, Professor Elwell? A great many more, thank you. Professor Barker. May I point out that these monkey shines are seriously delaying the concert of our student orchestra. Our concern here is the future good and welfare of our students as doctors of medicine, not as troubadours. Were you recognized? Professor Barker, we're all concerned about the delay of the concert. The fact that this hearing conflicts with it is a most unfortunate coincidence. You don't believe that any more than I do. Continue, Professor Elbow. Dr. Pretorius. I thought you'd forgotten me. Who is Shunderson? I take it you mean Mr. Shunderson. Mr. Shunderson is my friend. Is he associated with you professionally? Not as a professional. He helps in whatever he can. He is also employed in your home as a manservant or a butler, is he not? I do not employ him at all. He works at whatever he pleases, where he pleases, and when. He is never very far from your side, or for long, it seems. Rarely. Dr. Pretorius, what was Mr. Shunderson before you knew him? I refuse to answer that question. What were the circumstances under which you made his acquaintance? I refuse to answer that question. You have always evidenced a remarkable tolerance for this strange and mysterious man. His qualifications have been questioned. His blundering and slow-wittedness have caused complaint, and yet you have protected him at all times to the fullest extent of your authority. His qualifications concern no one but me, since his responsibility is to no one but me. As to his so-called blundering and so-called slow-wittedness, perhaps I overlooked them because I know the reason for them. And is the reason of so delicate a nature that you cannot divulge it even here? I have no right to divulge it anywhere. May I suggest to you then, Dr. Pretorius, that your refusal to divulge it is not out of loyalty to Mr. Shunderson, but is due to some unsavory and dishonorable coercion upon you, because the reason which has been so delicately characterized here, has to do simply with Mr. Shunderson having been a convicted murderer. What are you doing here? I was listening through the door. I protest against this highly irregular, unethical, and probably prearranged eavesdropping. Elwell, you can use more words more unpleasantly than any irritating little pipsqueak I've ever known. Gentlemen, I suggest we leave the saloon floor and return to a more academic level of behavior. I want to tell my story. He'll never tell it. But what you want to know about me has nothing to do with him. Well, let's hear it by all means. Okay. Certainly, Mr. Shunderson. Okay. I 
I'm not a fancy talker. I, I don't know a lot of words. That alone is a welcome relief. <clears throat> well, now, I... Don't start with well, now. Where, where should I begin? Tell them when you were condemned to death for murder. The first time? Of course. Well, the first time was in Canada in 1917. It was Christmas. It wasn't a very merry Christmas. Don't editorialize, just tell the facts. I had a sweetheart and a friend. We were very close, the three of us. We went everywhere together. Well, this one time we went mountain climbing. My sweetheart couldn't climb very high, so she stayed behind at a hotel while my friend and I went on. We didn't get very far before we started to argue. I don't remember what about. We always argued, as friends do. But this time he hit me with a rock. So I hit him with one. Not too much detail. Anyway, we had a bloody fight, and he ran away. So I went back to my sweetheart. She was waiting in the lobby of the hotel. She didn't even say hello. She took one look at the blood on my clothes and saw that I was alone and started to scream, murderer, murderer. That was how I found out that my sweetheart and my friend were sweethearts. Who saw to it that you were arrested and charged with murder? Oh, my sweetheart, of course. Her testimony and the blood on my clothes were enough. I was found guilty of murdering my friend, and I was condemned to death. But because nobody could produce the corpse of my friend, living or dead, my sentence was commuted to 15 years at hard labor. And was the corpse of your friend never found? I found it myself after I served out my full 15 years at hard labor. I found it accidentally. I was walking past a restaurant in Toronto. I happened to look in the window and there was the corpse of my friend sitting at a table eating a bowl of soup. I think it was pea soup. Immaterial and irrelevant. Well, I, I went in and spoke to my friend in a very friendly fashion. I asked him very nicely where he had been for 15 years and why he never admitted that I didn't kill him. His answer, gentlemen, was unsatisfactory. So I hit him in the face with the bowl of soup. Then I hit him with a chair. Somebody called a policeman. The policeman had a club. I took the club away from him. And it was with the policeman's club I finished up on my friend. I tried to explain to the policeman that if I was committing a crime, it, it was a crime for which I had already paid the penalty. He arrested me anyway. You were released, of course. No. I was tried for his murder again and sentenced to death again. But how could you be tried twice for the murder of the same man? The prosecutor insisted that this was not the same murder. The first time, no dead body was produced as evidence. Well, the prosecutor was very fair about it. He was willing to admit that my first conviction was probably a miscarriage of justice, but even though the first jury made a mistake, he said I didn't have the right to commit a murder just to correct that mistake. He demanded the death penalty, and I was condemned to death. But uh, this time you were pardoned. No, this time they didn't even commute my sentence. You see... The fact that I killed my friend with the policeman's club made it a very serious crime. Then, uh, will you tell us, Mr. Shanderson, how did you manage to escape? I didn't escape. Well, what happened to get you out of it? Nothing. I was executed. Executed? This is absurd. It was on the morning of the 29th of February, 1932. A leap year. It was a grey and rainy morning. The hangman put the noose around my neck. And then we had to wait because some official forgot his glasses. They held an umbrella over me so I wouldn't get wet. And then the official's glasses came. He read something. The minister prayed. I closed my eyes and thought of my mother. The floor went out from under me and that was that. 
I must protest against this fantastic and childish assault upon our, our intelligence. You'll be quiet. Then what happened? The next thing I felt was a finger with a rubber glove on it. It was in my mouth, pressing down on my tongue. I bit it and somebody yelled. I opened my eyes and that was the first time I saw Dr. Pretorius. Only he wasn't a doctor then, just a medical student. I think I can make this next part of the story clear to you. At the time all this happened, I was just finishing my studies as a medical student. I was also keeping company, as they say, with a young lady who happened to be the hangman's daughter. Both the hangman and his daughter were generous and sympathetic. The hangman, in particular, was sympathetic to my desire as a student of anatomy to have a cadaver of my own. Well, knowing that Mr. Shunderson's body would go unclaimed, because certainly no one was ever more alone in this world than poor Mr. Shunderson was, the hangman managed to send it to me immediately after the hanging, along with a sweet note from his daughter. I was delighted, of course. But not for long. I soon found out that Mr. Shunderson was still alive. You must have been furious. He told me a story. We put some pig iron in the cheap wooden coffin that he'd arrived in and had it buried in a charity graveyard. From that day on, he has never left me. And I think it is understandable that from time to time he may seem a little confused and perhaps even a little dull-witted. I don't mean to intrude too much, gentlemen, but I, I'm sure that by now you must have made up your minds. Deborah, a wife simply does not come barging into a room when her husband is being investigated. After all, if he's innocent, he's late for the concert. And if he isn't, well, he'd better start conducting anyway, because he may have to earn his living at it. I am of the opinion the hearing is at an end. Do you agree, Professor Elwell? The trouble with you is, Elwell, you've never had a cadaver of your own, much less one that bit your finger. And as for this incredible evening, gentlemen, the sooner we can forget it, the better for all concerned. And I think we've held up the concert far too long. Professor Elwell, you're a little man. It's not that you're short, you're little in the mind and in the heart. Tonight you try to make a man little whose boots you couldn't touch if you stood on tiptoe on top of the highest mountain in the world. And as it turned out, you're even littler than you were before. 